I'm going to talk to you for the next 40 minutes or so about something I call life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, because a good way to get your conference talks chosen is to have a stupid joke in the name of the talk. Um, it's a talk about something that I call happy code, and I'm going to talk you through what that is, and why I think it's important, and why I think that there's things that all of us in you know, software development, whatever we do, could be doing slightly differently. But uh, a little bit about me first. Uh, this is me. I've been building websites since 1992, which is basically forever in internet years. I'm a Microsoft MVP with the Visual Studio and Developer Tools program. I'm based in London. I run a .NET user group there in London. Uh, this is my website. It's my email address. Um, my Twitter handle is on there. Anything you want to follow up on, any you know questions or comments or discussion, find me on Twitter. Drop me an email. I'm always really happy to, to chat about this stuff. Now, for the last uh, sort of 50, until the end of last year, I worked for this company. It's a company based in London. They're called Spotlight. And Spotlight is a directory of actors, professional actors, and uh, services for finding work in films and television, theater, these kinds of things. So a lot of the stuff that I sort of learned about code, I've learned while I've been, I've been working for them, because I've been there a long time. And in theater, every industry has its standard kind of clip art, you know, the stuff that consultants use when they want to cap capture your industry. And theater, this is our standard clip art. This is the Greek theater masks of comedy and tragedy, happiness and sadness. And that's one of the ideas that we're going to explore today, you know, this idea of creating positive user experiences and code that is kind of happy and enjoyable to work with. The other thing that we are going to be talking about is something called discoverability, discovery. This is, discoverability is a word that describes a system that you can explore, something you can play with, and you can find out for yourself, you can do experiments, you can see how it works, and it, it affords, it encourages this kind of exploration and play. And there's a sort of very good reason. One, I think these kind of systems are more pleasant to work with and they're more interesting. But also, they're over. Anybody here get into code because they enjoyed solving puzzles? You know, like doing little puzzles and crossword puzzles and maths puzzles. And yeah, I, I, you know, I did. Um, and then you get a computer and you're like, wow, this is just like one really big puzzle. I can make it do things and I can make it print and I can make it change colors and all this kind of stuff. Um, and there have been these uh, studies done about the way that the human brain changes when you're learning things. And there is this thing, it's called dopamine. It's a chemical that is released in your brain when you solve a puzzle. And it's also, it is, it's the chemical that drives addiction. So when gamblers are you know, playing poker and they, they keep playing, every time they win, they get this rush of dopamine. And it gives them this incentive to keep going. And we get the same thing when, if you've ever stayed up all night debugging code, and you're just like, OK, oh, no, there's another problem. Hey, I fixed it. Oh, another problem. Hey, I fixed it. And you're going round and round. That's dopamine. That's this little cycle. And the thing about dopamine is that when you get this, this dopamine rush in your brain, you become better at learning. So if we can create systems that encourage people to explore them with this sort of solving puzzles approach, people are going to learn those systems more easily. They will remember the information better, they will be able to use it, they will become productive more effectively. And if you're, you know, you're maintaining, a, say, an open source project and you want people to start using your, your frameworks, maybe you uh, work for a company, you have a code base and you have new developers joining, there are all these ways in which other people are going to have to learn how to use the systems that we create. And so I'm going to show you some ideas today that you can build into those systems to make that uh, easier, you know, make that process better. So, <coughs> pardon me. I want to talk about this idea of, of learning curves. Are you familiar with this expression, a learning curve? So, learning curve basically is, it is not scientific, you know, there are no units on these graphs here. But basically, expertise, this is how good, how proficient you are working with a system. And this one here is experience. This is how long you have been working with the system. Now, one of these, this is what we call a steep learning curve. This is what we call a shallow learning curve. Hands up, show hands. Who thinks a steep learning curve is better? Who thinks the blue one's better? Anybody? Who thinks the shallow one is better? Who thinks it's a stupid question? <laughs> um, yeah, this, uh, you know, the steep learning curve is, um, 
someone who's gone home and they've taught themselves Haskell in a long weekend, you know, and they come in on Monday, you're like, you learned Haskell in a weekend? And they're like, yeah, dude, I just read the manual. And you're like, whoa. Um, and this one is someone, they've been using Microsoft Word for like 10 years, and they still don't know how to do a section break, you know? We, we all worked with both of these kinds of people. Um, they're both fine, you know? Some systems, a steep learning curve just means you put in a lot of work and you get a very rapid return on, on your investment. You, you learn quickly. Shallow learning curve just means you can be comfortable working with something for a long period of time and productive without necessarily having to learn all the quirks of the system. What you need to watch out for is this. This is a localized peak, and we get this in software all the time because in software we often work with abstractions. And uh, the thing Spolsky's law, Joel Spolsky's law of leaky abstractions, any abstraction eventually is going to leak. Now, anyone here build ASP.NET web forms when that first came out? I know I did. Now, you know, web forms looks really good when they first showed it off in the demo. You go in and they're like, we drag the, the button onto the web page and then you double click and you write some code and you have your data grid and look at database and update and all this kind of stuff. And it looks pretty good. And then your boss comes to you one day and says, uh, we need to build a streaming media server. And you go into Visual Studio, you look in the toolbox and you're like, there's no streaming media server, <laughs> you know. And you're like, okay, and you start reading and you think, they lied to me. All this stuff with the buttons and view state and everything, that's not actually how the internet works. So you've done all this work to get good at web forms, and then you're like, actually, I need to throw that away. I need to go and understand how HTTP works, and I need to understand you know, chunked protocols and zips and headers and compression. And so you have to kind of throw away all the work you put in and get back down to here, and then you've got to work your way up again. Now, this is bad, because that, that weekend when you're like, everything I have learned here is useless, you're going to go home feeling sad. You know, this is not a good place to be. So I, I do not like systems that create these, these uh, you know, leaky abstractions and these localized peaks. Now, what you really want to avoid, this is <laughs> going to call this back. Was anyone in uh, Sander Hugendon's keynote yesterday where he's talking about drawing an owl? So this is, this is a, a, a learning curve. You know, this is, so you draw an oval, bang, and then you draw an oval for the body, and then, yeah, let's draw the rest of the owl. You know, it's how to draw an owl in three easy steps. There's a brick wall here. You know, you've learned, you got up to a point, and then you're like, bang, I can't see how to get from here to here. It's, it's you know, there is no way. The system you've created, people reach a dead end, and they can't go any further than that. This is like, uh, does anyone understand monads? Liar. <laughs> So, you know, people who understand monads cannot explain it to people who don't. Because they're like, well, it's just a monoid in a category of endofunctors. And you're like, I don't know what that is. And they say, well, it's kind of like a type amplifier. And you're like, I don't know what that is, you know. There's the, the experience of computer programming up to a certain point doesn't equip you with anything that lets you make a sort of gradual series of steps to understanding things like monads. So, these brick walls are, you know, they're, they're dead ends, brick walls. Someone's working with the system, they hit one of these, they're just going to stop. They're going to be stuck and there's going to be nothing they can do. Now, one of the first things that inspired this talk, and this is going back a long time, sort of 2008, 2009, to the, the first wave of what we called alt.net, I was working with a thing called Castle Windsor. And I downloaded the code and I'd installed it. I got it up and running and I pressed F5 and I got an error message, this yellow screen of death. And I thought, ugh, you know. Stupid, it doesn't work, I've done it wrong. But if you look very closely, there's a couple of things about this error message I think are brilliant. One of them is it says, looks like you forgot. It doesn't say you're stupid. It doesn't say bad command, invalid, missing. It says, hey, you know, we're friends and I'm just helping you, it looks like you forgot. You know what you're doing. You don't know what you're doing, you know, I just downloaded it, I had no idea. But this is kind of really friendly and it's helpful. And then it says, hey, you know, to fix this, and it gives you this little chunk of XML here inside the error message in the exception. So you grab that, and you paste it into your config file, and you press F5, and it works. And you think, one, this is awesome, dopamine, bang, I'm never going to forget how to configure Castle Windsor again. Two, you think, I love the people who built Castle Windsor, they want me to be happy. They've written this really nice, helpful, friendly error message to help me out here. And so you come away, one, you've solved your problem, Two, you've learned something. And three, they've created this very kind of positive first experience of using Windsor for you as, as a developer. And the point about that, you know, lots of people, they work on an engineering team where they have a front-end person, or they have some designers, or they have a user experience department. 
And it's an easy trap to fall into to think, well, if we have a UX department, then user experience is their problem. We just do code. We just make databases. We just do class libraries. But actually, all of us are creating user experiences all the time. You know, if I build a database and I, I give it to you, you're going to have to work with my data schema. You are the user. I am responsible for that experience. If I build a class library and I put it on uh, GitHub and say, you download it and want to do some work with it, you're a user. I've created that experience. User experience is not just about front end and mobile apps and stuff. It applies to any situation where someone is going to be working with a system that you created. So. I'm going to tell a story. I'm going to tell the same story twice. First one, you've joined a new team, and you get in Monday morning. You're like, hey, everybody. And they're all like, welcome. Here's a coffee machine. All right, let's get you started. Get the website up and running. You think, OK, it's cool. I'm a developer. How hard can this be? So you sit down at your terminal, and you go and you do a little bit of a search, and you're like, OK. You go into GitHub, and there's a project there called Website. You check it out. It's empty. There's no code. You're like, oh, hang on. There's another project here called Website Final. And you check that one out, and it's empty. There's no code. And there are oh, website 2017. Maybe that's it. And eventually, you turn to the person at the next desk, and you say, hey, Sergey, where's the website code? And Sergey takes his headphones off, and he's like, oh, it's in a repo called Sales Finance. You're like, what? And he says, yeah, the sales and finance team hired the developers, so they put all the code in, in that repo. OK. So you, know, you check the code out. And you press build, and it fails. It says, couldn't find uh, mycompany.version.dll. And you're like, you Google it. Of course, it doesn't find anything. It's an internal component. So you turn to Sergey again, and you go, hey, sorry. He takes his headphones off, and you're like, where's mycompany.dll? And Sergey's like, oh, yeah, it's, it's in C program files. Here, let me share my hard drive. So he opens his hard drive, and you copy all these files across. And a couple of minutes later, Sergey, it's like, what? It's like, where do I get the database? He's like, oh, yeah, we, we had a restore script, but it doesn't work. You're going to need to copy it off, off my machine. And, you know, and this just goes on. And if you're lucky, at the end of the day, you, know, you haven't upset Sergey too much, and you managed to get the code working. But if you're not, you can just end up at a dead end. You, know, you get, this is my favorite Visual Studio error message. Where do you go from here? You know? This is like somebody at Microsoft sat there one day and went, you know what, I'm going to write an error message that says, unspecified error. I don't care. It's late, and I want to go home, and I, I do not care about the people who are using my product right now. You know, this is, this is not good. This is a total dead end. So same story again. You started work with a new organization. Going on Monday morning, you sat down, like, hey. The guy says, hey, I'm Sergey. Welcome. Uh, let's get you up and running with the website. Uh, by the way, the website is a project called Applejack. You go on a GitHub, and you're like, ooh, Applejack, clone the repository. You press F5. First thing that happens is you go, ooh, it's restoring NuGet packages from nuget.mycompany.com. It's downloading. They've got an internal package repository where they've got all their different DLLs and components they use. This whole thing's been set up. Brings up a screen. A web browser opens, and it says, hey, you know, well done. You're up and running. Uh, you're going to need a local database, by the way. We see that you don't have one. Go and have a look in the code repository for Applejack. There's a folder in there called SQL. That's where you'll find the schema scripts. So one, solve the problem. Two, you've learned something. Three, bang, a little dopamine rush. So you're going to remember, because you've just learned it by solving that problem, that all the database schema scripts are in a folder called SQL. And so you get it up and running. And you know, 12 o'clock, you go out for some lunch. And Sergey says, hey, you know, come on, let, let's go and get some hamburgers. And on your way out, you say, why is the code repository called Applejack? And he said, oh, we just name everything after my little pony. Because it's easy, you know? And uh, I use this one because Applejack has got this, this hat, which I like. So, um, but you know, it sounds stupid. You say to your team, I want to name all our projects after. Does anyone here actually have like a naming scheme they use for projects or servers or stuff? I know I do. Um, and the point is, names give you a really good way of, of kind of expressing boundaries in a system. So you say, OK, the website project is called Applejack. One, you go onto the wiki, you type Applejack, you'll find all the documentation related to that system. You know, you go on a wiki and type website, you're going to find everything. Because website is a word that gets used all over the place, whereas Applejack is a name. It's specific. You want to set up something like error logging, you can get messages. Hey, you know, Applejack is unavailable. Applejack is running slowly. Code repository, Applejack. Wiki, Applejack. Log files, Applejack. You just use this name everywhere. It'll sound kind of silly for two or three days, and after that, it just becomes part of the ubiquitous language that you're using to engage and communicate with your, your team and your stakeholders. OK, so we walked through one kind of interaction. I'm going to do a little history lesson now. Uh, this is 
very similar to the computer that I used when I first started learning how to program. Uh, it was a 286 PC, had a whole megabyte of RAM, and when you switched it on, it said A. And you went, I got a computer at home, this is so exciting, and you go, hello, and it goes, bad, command or file name. <laughs> and you're like, uh, I, I, uh, you go, menu, and it says, bad, command or file name. And you type in help, and it says, bad, command or file, and you just, and so you get the MS-DOS manual, which was a book about this thick, which was very, very dull, and you go through it, and it's like, oh, D-I-R, enter. You know, but there's nothing you can do here. Basically, at this point, all you can do to explore it is you can go, A, enter, bad, B, enter, bad, C, enter, bad. You know, you just, it's trial and error. You have no idea, you know, you're not getting any kind of feedback from the system. There's no signifiers, it's not telling you what's possible. Um, the only fun thing you could do with MS-DOS is you could do, if you're happy and you know it, syntax error. And it would go, syntax error. <laughs> yeah, this was the most fun you could have with DOS. Now, the other computers that were around the same time had a completely different paradigm. This was the original Apple Macintosh. And when you switched on the Macintosh, you didn't get a black screen with A, you got this. And immediately you're like, okay, this is cool. You sort of, you know, you work out that the mouse moves this little arrow on the screen because none of us had ever seen a mouse before. And then you're like, all right, so there's this, this thing here looks like a trash can, so maybe I can throw things away here. Um, and I got, you know, this, this thing here, and it says there's file and edit and view and this little brightly colored apple, maybe I can click on these things. And so it lends itself to exploration. It's a much, much friendlier first experience of a system. You can actually go in and start playing around with things. Now. There's a pattern that I've seen time and again where people, they look at this and they think, well, if we put all of the options on the screen, it will make our product easy to use. So you get this. <laughs> you know, it's easy. you type your program here. That's, that's how, you, how you do programming. Um, so, you know, at the one extreme, we have MS-DOS with this, this blank screen with A in the corner. But at the other extreme, we have, I mean, this is every single menu and option in Visual Studio 2017, all switched on at the same time. There must be a thousand different commands on that screen. I don't know what they do. Nobody knows what they all do, you know. What you need to do is to create systems that encourage exploration and then they reward it. Now, a little while ago, I was checking out Edge, which is you know, Microsoft's new standards compliant browser that ships with Windows 10. Um, I fired up Edge for the first time, and I went in and I was like, hey, I'm a web developer, where's my stuff? So I went right click and I'm like, there's nothing, there's no view source, there's no inspect, there's no debug, I can't use this, you know, I'm a serious professional. This is a, like a tool for kids. And then I went, I clicked this little context menu, and I went, aha, F12, developer tools. Now one, there's no other F numbers here. I've like, F12, I've solved the problem, I'm gonna remember F12 does developer tools. Then you switch it on, and this is the thing I think is really cool. When you activate that feature for the first time, inspect element and view source will now appear in the context menu, you know? You ever had like uh, one of your, your relatives or your, your mum or something call you up and go, I broke the internet, and all they've done is they've done view source. And they're like, the internet's leaking and all the code is coming out. Um, you know, I love the fact that these tools are there, but they've worked out for most people, they don't need inspect element and view source. Most people use the web to go shopping and buy tickets and stuff. But for developers, the second you've discovered this, you've said, I know what I'm doing, please give me my tools. And it goes bang, there you go. They will now appear in the context menu. So I thought this was a really kind of smart way of encouraging this exploration of the system. And it also gives you that feedback loop of the system saying back to you, all right, we get it, let's, let's do some work here. Now, you can do this in code. So I'm sure everybody here who's, who's worked in .NET or Java or any languages which support it, this thing called intelligent code completion. You can type in the name of a, a, a class or an object in your library, you press dot and it pops up with a list of stuff. Now, you know, this is old news. I did not come all the way to Novosibirsk to tell you about autocomplete and intelligent code completion. You've seen this stuff before. But have you ever thought of using this to create your own helper methods to help you out when you get stuck? I've been writing .NET code for 20 years, and when I go new SQL connection, I cannot remember, still can't remember what a connection string looks like. I always hit a brick wall when I get to this point. You're in a new SQL connection, and I'm like, ugh. I have to go and look it up and alt tab and browser and then I've forgotten what I'm doing. So what I did is I wrote this little helper method called sql.connect and inside 
the tooltip that pops up when you get there, I put the documentation for the connection string syntax that you use. So at the exact point where you're writing some code and you'd get stuck, this thing pops up and goes, hey, I got the thing you can never remember. Between us, we're going to work this out. And it's actually really easy to do this, because all you have running on the back end here is um, in, in .NET and C Sharp, this triple slash is what we use to create comment documentation. And it's this little summary and parameter thing which pop up in the code editor as you're working with it. So it's a really common pattern. You know, we've all used this. But you can actually, particularly if you're creating class libraries, you can put your documentation in the code itself such that when somebody else starts working with the system you built, you're going to be kind of helping them out step by step as they go along. Now, up till now, we've talked about code. We've talked about the act of you know, creating systems, writing code, building tools. There's another really important element to the way code behaves and the way that it affects the people who have to use it. And this is about what happens when it's actually running. We write code, great. Code goes to production, you go home. At that point, the code is someone else's problem. Maybe it's, you know, you're going to get called out of bed. Maybe there's an engineer who's on call who's looking after that repository over the weekend. Now, let's run two scenarios again. You get into work and the phone rings. And your boss says, the system's down. And you're like, uh, OK, um, let me check and get back to you. You take a message, and you go, and the phone rings again. And someone else says, the website's broken. And you're like, all right, let me investigate. And you, know, you go through this whole process, and your boss is going, when's it going to be fixed? And you're like, I don't know. All I know is the, the system is down. I have no visibility here. There's a problem somewhere. And eventually, you get someone on the phone who's like, yeah, I can send you a screenshot. And they send you a screenshot, and the screenshot just says, uh, you know, request timeout. And you're like, OK, so a request timed out somewhere in our application, which has 150,000 lines of code. And your boss is like, when's it going to be fixed? And you're like, well, there's 150,000 lines of code, and I can probably read one line every five minutes. So you know, if I'm lucky, maybe the bug is there in the first place I look. If I'm not lucky, we'll still be here next year. Um, and so you're upset. You know, you're frustrated because you're trying to get the system I'm running. You don't know where to start looking. You know nothing. Your boss is frustrated. Your customers are frustrated. The whole system just does not work. So. Get rid of the phone. This is an actual photograph of the actual wall in my old office. And we put up a big screen TV, and we plugged it into a, a logging system, a thing called PRTG. And we connected that to monitors. The first thing we had is, let's just do an HTTP request to the home page of our website. And if we get back 200 OK, that means things are good. If we don't get a 200 OK, that means we have a problem. And then we started adding additional points to it. And most of the time, on a good day, the screen looks like this. It's green. If something goes wrong, these big squares go red. And you can see immediately. So I can see here, you walk past the screen, OK, so the content delivery network is down, and the main website's down, and the internet's down. All right, well, I already know that the internet and the website both depend on the content delivery network, so I know that the CDN is where I have to go and start looking. So immediately, you can, one, tell people, hey, it looks like there's a problem. The website and the internet are unavailable. We're working on it. So instead of them coming to you, you go straight to them. When they get the phone call from the customer, they're like, yeah, please, we're very sorry. Our team is you know, already engaged. They're working on it. It'll be back up in a few minutes. The other thing that we kind of didn't realize when we put the screen in is other people start paying attention to it. So if you work in an office with a whole bunch of different you know, business people and product people, they'll come over, walk over to your desk. And they used to come over like, hey, you know, can we have your money for the lottery or we're collecting for a gift for somebody who's getting married? If they see the screen is red, they're like, now is not a good time. And they go away, which is brilliant. And what's even better is if the screen is all red, they come over and go, is everything all right? Can I get you coffee? Do you want someone to go and get sandwiches and stuff? And so it makes even you know, people who aren't technical uh, you know, members of your delivery team, whatever, they feel like they're involved. They feel like they're part of the team that's trying to solve this problem. And that just creates this kind of much nicer and more pleasant environment in which to, in which to work, to collaborate with people. Now, the thing about monitoring is it's a little bit like the kind of application design. You need to be very pragmatic and pay attention to what it is that you actually expose. If you just put sensors on everything, you end up with something that looks like this. This is the flight deck of the space shuttle. And there's probably 5,000 lights on here. And astronauts are trained to know what all the lights mean, but we have no idea. You don't want this. What you want to do is to break down the level of complexity into something kind of roughly approximate to this, like the dashboard of a car. Maybe 10, 12 systems. Now, it's up to you to work out which systems make sense. If you're in a small organization where you have three or four physical on-premise servers, 
Maybe you monitor the servers, one, two, three, four, and if you have a problem, it's the server where you start the investigation. Um, maybe if you're using like a microservice architecture, you can say, well, let's put monitoring endpoints on each of the components. So we've got the sales processing system, we've got the, um, you know, the CMS, the content management system, we've got the backend database system, we've got the stock control system. Put monitors on each of those. What you want is enough visibility that if, if you have a problem, if one of your systems starts misbehaving or stops working, you know where to look, you know where to start investigating, and it gives you kind of very immediate feedback where you should start drilling in and, and looking for the problem. Now, you know, this kind of stuff with monitoring is all well and good in terms of what is happening right now this second. But often that information isn't useful unless you have some context about what was happening previously. And so the counterpart to monitoring is logging, which is why we have lumberjacks. <laughs> now, say you get in the morning, you know, there's a problem up on the board. Your boss says, looks like there's a problem, you know, I'll get the coffee. You go and look at it, and you go and you're like, okay, CPU consumption. Oh, I see what's happened. Our database server is maxed out, 100% CPU. Is that good? And we're not wasting any CPU, so maybe it's good, I don't know. The point is, you have no idea what has caused this. You know that the database server has hit 100% capacity, and therefore you can't accept any more connection requests, but you don't know why. Now maybe this is what has happened. The CPU usage has been climbing gradually over time. It's getting busier and busier and busier, and you've just suddenly hit 100%, and now you can't accept any more connection requests. Maybe you have some process that has been running periodically, like a scheduled task or a batch job that has been getting bigger every time it runs, ding, ding, ding. and then suddenly today, for the first time, that batch job is hitting 100%. Or maybe your database is ticking along perfectly happily, and then you deploy some code to production, and everything goes horribly wrong. You know, the same data point here means very different things depending on how it got there. These three things tell a very, very different story about how this happened. And the other thing that's relevant is this time series here. How long did it take for this to happen? In one scenario, this is one day. This is 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock. So the little green spike here, maybe you have a process that runs every hour transaction log restores or you know, shipping or something. Um, this one here is what happened today. Is there some job going on? Did we like release a really big special offer and we got all these people jumping on our website to buy cheap tickets? This one here is you've been working away all day and then four o'clock you accidentally ship some bad code. We, I, I, we never do this, of course, but some people do this. It could be January, February, March. You know, the same pattern, the same shape, the same graph, but instead of being a day, it's a year. It's a very, very different story about how you go and start diagnosing that system. So this one here, you know, the January, February, March, okay, what do we do on the first weekend of every month that maybe has been getting bigger and bigger and bigger? The blue line here is our company is growing, we're getting more customers, or maybe the size, the volume of our data is growing. Um, the red one is probably still someone shipped some bad code to production, because this still happens, you know. Um, but, you know, each of them, you get a, a very, very different story. And if you have this level of visibility, what you really want to do with the blue line, particularly, is you want to go to your, your, your boss about here and go, we're going to run out of database space. And the boss says, when? And you go, half past three in the afternoon on the 15th of July. And the boss will go, wow, that's amazing. You're like, look, we have a graph. This is when it's going to happen. And so you can provision some capacity. You can upgrade the box or, you know, cut down some log files, maybe ship some processing onto a different system. Having this level of, level of visibility into your running systems just gives you a whole different way of understanding and predicting what it is they're doing and how they're going to behave. Now, alongside this kind of systems logging, you also have the logging that we can build into our applications as developers to help other people work out what was going on when something went wrong. There's five levels of logging that are used in most sort of conventional frameworks. There's fatal, there's error, there's warn, there's info, and there's debug. And what's really important, so the first golden rule of logging is get the logs off the box where they're running and put them somewhere central. Log entries, Graphite, Splunk, you know, any of these services, there's lots of software as a service providers that do this. There are lots of homebrew systems you can put together yourself that do this. The reason you do this is, um, raise your hand if, if this has ever happened to you. You've got a, a server, and you've gone in, and you've set up verbose logging, and then you've gone away, and then a week later the server crashes, and you're like, What's wrong with it? Oh, yeah, it's full of logs. 
the log files have overloaded the hard drive, and now Windows won't boot because there's no space on drive C. So one, you've actually crashed the box by trying to add logging to it. Two, you can't get to the logs to find out what it was that went wrong because the box that the logs are on is now dead. And three, if there's a problem and you don't know which box it's on, you have to go digging through every single server or every node in your cluster and dig through the log files on each of them individually in turn. So get the logs off the box, get them somewhere central, somewhere you can index them, somewhere you can search them. And as soon as you do that, you're going to realize that there's probably different people and teams in your organization who are using these levels to mean different things. So it's really important to agree across all your teams what these different levels actually mean. Now, the way that I like to work with them, to me, fatal means this is a big deal. This is a serious error that is affecting the entire organization. Now, there are some systems in most companies that are just not that urgent. You know, there are things like the main uh, order processing and payment system on a front-end website. That's important. If that breaks, instantly no one can spend money. But then there's also, you know, the tools that like your finance team use to run a report at the end of every month. If that system is unavailable, you don't need to get up in the middle of the night and fix it. You know, you can wait. It's not fatal. You can say, I'm really sorry, you know, there's a problem, we'll fix it, it'll be back up and running in the morning. This thing is not that big a deal. And so there will be applications that should never ever have a fatal error message being logged. To me, errors and warnings are stuff that happens. It's inevitable. You know, software isn't perfect. There's the fallacies of distributed computing. Networks fail, requests fail, servers fail, clusters fail. Now, to me, the distinction here, an error is something that somebody noticed, but then they kind of pressed F5 and it went away. Maybe they tried to load a page and just that one request timed out. Maybe they got a database transaction deadlock. You know, these things happen. Log it as an error, say, we're really sorry. They press F5 or they try again. It's something that the user can work around. A warning is something nobody noticed, but it's still odd. It's something you managed to recover from, but you still want to know that it happened. So a good example of this, if you're using APIs to retrieve data from some remote service, um, say we got a foreign exchange, like exchange rates between pounds and rubles. And every time someone makes a transaction, if they choose a different currency, we go and get fresh exchange rates. Now, if that fails once, that's all right. We'll just use the, re the reply from last time. We'll cache the data and we'll fall back. We'll have rates that are maybe five minutes old. If it fails 10 times, you're like, okay, well, now it's an hour out of date, but it's probably still good enough. If it fails 100 times, at this point, we're using finance data that's maybe two or three days out of date, at which point we have a problem. Now, nobody's noticed. You know, the system is still responding, and it's still processing transactions. What you want to look out for here are not the individual messages. You want to look out for volume. It's like, uh, you ever ride the metro and you see someone who's dressed up because they're going to like a costume party? You get that, that's normal. But if you see this, it means something interesting is going on because this is not normal. You know, you're like, why is everybody on this metro dressed up as a giant panda? Info messages are kind of just reassuring. You know, everything is fine, start up, shut down, cash recycle. The main value for me in info messages is, let's say you have a long weekend and you come back in the office on Monday morning and there's nothing in the log files. They're completely empty. Now, one, we had a perfect weekend. No errors, no warnings, no fatals, nothing went wrong. Or two, the logging infrastructure failed. Which do you think is more likely? Info is just a kind of, you go and you're like, okay, wow, everything is actually up all weekend. I can see things have been recycling, we've been refreshing the cache every 10 minutes. There's no errors, there's no warnings. This is actually pretty cool. Whereas a blank log file is like, this is really suspicious. We need to go and start investigating. And debug uh, logging, this to me is diagnostic information. One of the best habits I think you can get into as a developer, you're building a new system. The first time you do you know, response.write or console.write line, stop, install a logging infrastructure, start using log.debug to do that instead. And log everything, all the information that's useful to you as a developer when you're working with a system, when you're exploring a system, troubleshooting a system, capture that in debug logs. It's going to be a lot of data, you know, there's going to be lots of it. But when you deploy your code to production, you can just switch off debug. Leave all the code in there. It was useful when you were working on it. You don't need it in production. But then one day, you're going to get an incident that you cannot recreate locally. You can't repl replicate it on your staging environment. It won't work on dev. The only time it ever happens is on the live system at 2 o'clock in the morning. And so what you can do is just while you're investigating, you can switch debug logging back on in production. And then when you're sat there in the middle of the night, you actually have enough information to go in and, and diagnose and see what the problem with this is. 
Um, I think the software industry could have saved itself a great deal of time if instead of using fatal error warn info debug, we'd actually given these things good names. So instead of uh, log fatal, should have had uh, log arasbudmenya vecetari utra. Log error should have been log izvinis pered polzavaltem izanishi. Warning should be soovshchi es lietos luchita este storaz. Info sem horosho prosto prevaka. And debug should just be Zapolnita um, moja <laughs> diska stack trace. And this. <laughs> Because, you know, someone got log dot fate or whatever. It's like, if you have to write log dot wake me up at 4 o'clock in the morning, you're going to stop and you're going to think, do I really want to get woken up at 4 o'clock in the morning if this line of code gets hit? You know, I think this, this kind of verbosity just encourages a much clearer way of thinking about the significance of what we're doing. Um, and this, by the way, a guy called Daniel Labrero had this blog post where he started out with this idea and I took it, adapted it into this slide. Um, but I think, you know, this, I, I put a version of this up on Twitter and it, it went crazy. I think it really clearly kind of just communicates why these different levels exist and, and what we can do with them. So let's recap. Rules of happy code. Number one, names. Give things names. My Little Pony, you know, transformers, islands, cities, anything you like. Just come up with a system where when you create a new application or a new product, it's very, very easy to give it a name and then use the name. Use the name in documentation, use it in logging, use it in code repositories and monitoring and alerts and all these kinds of things. And don't worry too much if it sounds silly when you first do it. Give it a couple of days and everyone will be like, hey, could you check? It looks like there's a problem with Applejack. And yeah, someone new is going to join the team and go, you have my little pony here? And you're like, no, Applejack is a sales procurement system. But you know, they get used to it. Remember the learning curves. You know, A steep learning curve is fine. Shallow learning curves are fine. Watch out for dead ends. Remember the owl. Remember monads. Don't create brick walls and don't ever build ASP.NET web forms. <laughs> if you are throwing error messages, think about this. When your code goes wrong, you know what it was trying to do. And you know what you might be able to do to try and fix it. So put that information into the error message itself. Don't ever do unspecified error. Somebody knew what happened. You know, somebody who sat and wrote this code, and they're like, operation could not be completed. Now, this is the kind of thing you get when you have multiple teams who aren't talking to each other. So someone does like a, a method call, and they just get back null. And they're like, well, I don't know what null means. The method has no documentation. I can't get hold of the team who built it. I'm on deadline. Ah, hell with it. Unspecified error. That'll do. I'm going home. And that's because the people who they're working with weren't doing this. So whenever you're throwing error messages, exception stack traces, put in as much useful information as you can. Signposting. Let your users know where they are, where they can go from here. There are all sorts of patterns you can use to do this. And if you're building APIs, you can use hypermedia to make APIs that are discoverable. And you can actually expose those APIs in tools that let people browse your API as though it was a website. If you're building class libraries, use intelligent code completion to give people clues as to what they can do next. You know, this provides, you give people a sandbox, a test environment, you can say to them, look, go and play with our system. It doesn't matter, it's a sandbox. You can't break anything. Poke around, see what you can do, have a lot of fun, learn it as you go, and then when you're ready, we'll, we'll put stuff on production. Transparency. One of the things I loved about the old Star Trek show is that in the, the main engine room of the Enterprise, they have the engine right there in the middle of the thing. So there's all this technology, it's out on display. And when you go in and this thing isn't lit up blue, you're like, I know what's going to happen in this episode. There's going to be a problem with the warp engines because it's transparency. It's exposing information about systems that are running in a place where everyone can see it. Put screens up on the wall. You know, you've probably got a monitor in a cupboard somewhere. Take that monitor out, stick it on an old workstation, no one's used it, plug it into your logging infrastructure. Even if it's just one screen, website up, it's green. Websites down, it's red. People will get used to the idea that red means you have a problem right now and maybe they should get you some coffee and come back later. And that's cool. And the, the golden rule of happy code, we're all creating user experiences all the time. You're building a database, class library, open source project, a framework. Other people are going to be your users and it is up to you whether they are going to have a good day, bad day, get lots of stuff done, go home with a smile on their face. We're creating user experiences all the time. Let's try and make them good ones. Thank you.
Thanks, yes. Thank you, Dylan. We actually have a question. Uh, time for uh, one question. So one question. <laughs> there we go. Thank you, Dylan. Uh, and my question is: um, I think you know there is one more uh, error level. It's called trace. Mm -hmm. What's the secret difference between trace, debug, and info? Um, Trace is not one that I've worked with because Trace doesn't, I think, exist in Log4Net or Nlog, whichever the one we're working with. Um, so I'm going to need to go away and look that up and get back to you. My hunch would be that Trace would be an additional level of logging that's interesting for... Debug tends to be what's useful when a system's having a problem. It's a level of logging that you can use to show information like, you know, method, the exact values of parameters passed into methods and these kinds of things. Um, my hunch would be that trace logging is more useful for doing performance. So method entry times exit times heap size, stack size, this kind of stuff. So as well as seeing what the code is doing, you can see the impact that that is having on performance and stuff. Um, but like I said, that's speculation. So I'll get back to you. <laughs> All right. We're out of time. Spasiba. Thank you. Thank you.